and welcome to the Parent Workshop. My name is Kayleigh and today I'll be talking to you about what is autism and social communication differences. Before we start out, I just want to mention that all the information provided in this presentation is general information about autism and how this presents in children, which is based on research and my own personal experience of working with children with autism. So you may find that not all of this information applies to your child, and that is because children with autism um, present differently depending on where they are on the spectrum. So we always like to say when you've met one child with autism, you have only met one child with autism. So please hold that in mind when watching this presentation. Before we start, have a think about what is your goal? Why are you sitting through this online training? Is it to help understand the needs of your child better? Is it because you would like strategies to support your child or children? Perhaps write down your goal and see if this is achieved at the end of the training. Throughout the training, if you do have any questions or would like clarification on anything, then please do make a note of these and email your questions to the autism service at cognit.org.uk. And if you leave a contact number as well, as it might be easier for us to have a phone call to discuss this in relation to your child, um, but someone will be back in contact with you to respond to your questions. So today I'm going to start by talking about some terms that you may have heard of when talking about autism or perhaps professionals have used when referring to your child's diagnosis. So here are some terms that you may have heard of. First off, we have autism. So this is probably the most commonly used term and the one that I'll be using throughout the presentation. So we'll touch on a bit more later about what autism is and how this presents as an individual. Um, but yes, autism is probably the most preferred term and the one I'll be using throughout. Next, we have on the autism spectrum. So this is a phrase that quite often parents say that they've heard of, but are unsure of the meaning of this. So the way that we describe the autism spectrum is that it's a continuum and often the infinity symbol is used to represent this, coloured with rainbow colours from the visible spectrum of light. So as you can see the image that is presented on the slide. The importance of this is to highlight that people fluctuate throughout the day. So they fluctuate throughout activities, throughout society's influence and as the person's age changes. So one person with autism is not at a set point on the spectrum. So every aspect of the person's autism may change and may move on the spectrum throughout the day and that person's life. So an example that someone once told me was about an individual who was labelled to be on the high functioning end of autism, a term that I will touch on in a minute, because they were academically able and in a job role that met their needs well. They then had a series of events that challenged them, such as sensory overload, changing to an open plan office and having to face more face to face meetings, things that they found quite difficult. And as a result, they were sectioned because of this. So this example just shows that when a person with autism is in a place or environment where their needs are met well, for example, at school or perhaps at work, um, then the individual will feel calm and relaxed so will appear to be functioning well in the environment. However, in other areas of their day to day life, they may experience challenges, hence why we say that no one with autism is at one point on the spectrum and that they can fluctuate. Therefore, this means that although children with an autism diagnosis will show similarities to one another, there will also be a lot of differences due to their placement that is fluctuating on the autism spectrum. So hopefully this explanation makes the autism spectrum um, a little clearer. Next we have autism spectrum disorder, which is often abbreviated to ASD. So this tends to be a term that is used in the medical diagnostic manuals, but this is a term that has some negative connotations associated to this due to the word disorder being used and where possible the term autism will be used. So although the medical diagnostic manual still uses this term, the social model of disability is pushing towards um, the use of more positive language choices. For example, if we're thinking of you as parents and the young people themselves, it's difficult to be told that you have a disorder and it insinuates that you're already on the back foot and then having to try and find the positives associated with this new diagnosis. So throughout the presentation, I'll be mainly using the term autism. Next, we have autism spectrum condition, which is often abbreviated to ASC. So following on from autism spectrum disorder, autism spectrum condition was developed as a potentially more positive language choice by using the word condition as opposed to disorder. 
However, research has found that autistic individuals prefer the use of the word autism or autism spectrum. So this is what we usually use. And we also have Asperger syndrome. So this is a term that is not used anymore when given a diagnosis. However, those with this diagnosis often value the label and there's quite a community that use the term Aspie. Therefore, you may come across the use of Asperger's syndrome when talking to other people about autism. There are also some more confusing terms and these terms that unfortunately people may have come across but are not best practice, so need to be highlighted. So the first one we have is traits of autism. So this is where someone may not have received a formal diagnosis, but does show some aspects of social communication difficulties. The next is mild autism. So this is where an individual shows enough social communication difficulties or differences to warrant an autism diagnosis, but, but this does not impact on their life as much as some other people's diagnosis. However, again, this terminology, so both traits of autism and mild autism, uses negative medical language and we try to avoid using this as much as possible. Next is high and low functioning autism. So this is neither an official diagnosis nor is there really an agreed upon definition of what this term means. In the broadest sense of the term, high functioning autism may mean a person with relatively mild symptoms which despite their mildness are significant enough to merit an autism spectrum diagnosis. Low functioning autism is often used in the sense where someone may have autism as well as a learning disability, which is often referred to as having an IQ below 70. But again, this terminology should be avoided as it doesn't really relate to autism. So the use of high and low functioning autism has been confused with academia and IQ. So low functioning has been used to refer to individuals who have additional learning difficulties. But academia and IQ is not related to an autism diagnosis. Therefore, the high and low functioning is related to academics rather than autism. So hopefully just talking through this terminology has given a better explanation of what each of these mean and why some terms are preferred over others. So just hold it in mind about some of those terminology that is not usually used much anymore and that we prefer to use the term autism. So next, let's do a little quiz to try and distinguish between facts and fictions. So I'm going to show you a series of statements that you may have come across before. So have a go at home to try and answer whether the statements are true or false. So we have question one. Autistic individuals can often like routine and structure in their daily lives. So is that true or false? I'll give you a moment to think about that before I let you know the answer. So that is true. Autistic individuals may like to follow a routine such as a morning routine or a bedtime routine and this may be something that they have to follow quite strictly and religiously. Um, providing structure and routine for a child with autism can help reduce their anxiety levels as the child knows what to expect and what will be coming up. So yes that statement is true. Number two, autistic people often have unusual responses to sensory stimuli. So is that true or false? So again, that is true. Children with autism can often have sensory needs and may respond to senses in different ways. So for example, um, they might interpret noise as really loud, so put their hands over their ears to try and block some of this out, or perhaps cutting labels out of their clothes because this feels uncomfortable. So yes, this is true. Autistic individuals can have unusual responses to sensory stimuli. Question three. There can often be another member of the wider family who is somewhere on the spectrum. So is that true or false? So again, yes, this is true. So there are genetic links, but research has only been into a few genes. And likewise, there might be nobody in your family with an autism diagnosis. Um, or it may be that there is someone in the family, perhaps an older uncle, who is a bit eccentric or perhaps wouldn't have been given a diagnosis back when he was a child. 
but now research has developed into the field of autism, so we may have received a diagnosis if that research was available previously. Question four, there are more autistic boys than girls. So is that true or false? So that is false. There are not more autistic boys than girls, but girls tend to mask their autistic traits more than boys, meaning that these do not get picked up or perhaps the girls may not receive a formal diagnosis. So we will look at the potential differences between girls um, toward the end of the presentation. And question five, autistic individuals always present with an area of genius ability. So is that true or false? So this is false. The level of expertise is the same in a non-autistic child, but there may be higher knowledge levels due to the ability to focus on interest for a longer period of time for perhaps children or people with autism. So next we have question six. Autism has only been written about for the last 20 years. So is that statement true or false? So this statement is false. It was first written about in the 1940s by Leo Kanner and Hans Asperger, but there were delays in translating this information due to World War II. And more recently, they have discovered a lady writing about this in the 20s. So this statement is false. Number seven, autistic children have no interest in friendships. So is that true or false? So this statement is also false. Autistic children are interested in friendships, but they find it more difficult to form friendships due to communication differences. So we will touch on this in a bit more detail throughout the presentation, but yes, this statement is false. Number eight, autistic students function better in a specialist environment. So is that true or false? So this statement is false again. Autistic children can function just as well in a mainstream setting if reasonable adjustments are made. It's about ensuring that the child's needs are met in the environment that they are in. Question nine, autism is a childhood condition. So is that true or false? So this statement is false. Autism continues into adulthood, but is normally diagnosed in childhood. So autism is a different way of thinking. So it's part of who you are and your own identity. And question 10, I will not need to alter the way I communicate with an autistic child. So is that true or false? So this statement is false. Due to social communication differences, autistic children will understand and process information better if this is presented to them in, a, in an accessible way. So this might be using visual aids to support the understanding, reducing your language, um, and not relying on subtle cues such as body language. Again, we will touch on um, in this in a bit more detail in a further presentation. But overall, yes, um, this statement is false. Um, so altering your communication will be beneficial for the autistic child. So well done if you got 12 out of 12 on the quiz. Um, but hopefully that just cleared up some of the facts and fiction that you may have heard in relation to autism. So next we're going to start thinking about what actually is autism and how can we explain autism? And this is something that is quite tricky to do. So I like to use the following analogy um, and relating this to something that most people know. So as you can see on the slide, um, we have four pictures there. So we've got the Apple um, logo, we've got the Android logo, we've got PlayStation and we've got Xbox. So I'm going to take the first two. So thinking about Apple and Android. 
So if we're thinking about an iPhone and a Samsung phone, these both have um, similarities. They both can text, they can both call, they can both um, take photos, but the way that they are told to do this is different. So if we think about taking a photo on an iPhone, you can just swipe across and the camera turns on. Um, but on an Android, you swipe up from the bottom. So although they can both take a photo, the instructions to get to the camera are different. And they also have different chargers. So you can't use the iPhone charger for the Samsung phone and vice versa. But essentially, they both charge and they both do the same thing. And this is what it's like to have autism. So children with autism can do the same things as other people without autism, but they perhaps do this in a different way. And both systems are good, they are just different. So that's how I like to, to describe to people what it's like to have autism. And especially when I'm talking to children about this, this is how I tend to describe it because most children have heard of Apple or Android or PlayStation and Xbox. And I just like to use this to show how autism is like having a different system. So there's people with autism and people without autism, and they can both do the same things, but they might just do it in a different way. So now that we have thought about how autism is a different way of thinking, and that people with autism can do the same things as people without autism, just in different ways, it is now to, time to think about what actually is autism. So autism used to be spoken about as a triad or triangle, highlighting three main areas associated with autism, these being social communication, social interaction, and restrictive and repetitive behaviours or interests. The triad is the old diagnostic criteria and is no longer used, but we've displayed the key parts of a diagnosis in a star format, and these triad elements are highlighted in blue. So we're now going to look at these areas in a bit more detail. So firstly, we're going to look at social communication and social interaction. People with autism often find it difficult to socially communicate and interact with other people. This could be because of a number of reasons. So one reason for this is because people with autism can have a slower processing speed, meaning that they cannot process conversations easily and as quickly as people without autism, therefore making it difficult to respond in conversations. So I previously worked with a young man who explained to me that during a conversation, it is like a train going past but not stopping. So he could see all the doors, the windows and the people sitting on the train, but he could not jump on, like how he couldn't grasp a conversation. So he could hear all the words and knew that someone was speaking to him, but he couldn't process the information, therefore making it difficult to respond. So I just think that's a useful example to hold in mind when trying to relate to someone with autism and what it might be like for them trying to process a conversation. So another part of conversations are those com conversational rules and how we are meant to respond. So as we get older, we learn these rules. And as a young child, we kind of practice and learn these rules of turn taking and then having a to and fro conversation. So, for example, if someone asks us a question, the general social rule is to respond and build on this by asking them a question back to keep the conversation going. So children with autism may not have grasped these social rules, and this in turn then makes conversations and social interaction difficult. So both social interaction and social communications are a large part of what autism is. The third area of the triad is restrictive and repetitive behaviours or interests. So you might have noticed your child has a real focus around one topic and that this is very intense. So, for example, I worked with a child who had an intense interest in SpongeBob SquarePants, the TV programme. So they could tell me the storyline of every episode, who were the guest speakers, what year they were made um, and who produced the um, animation in that episode. And this is because they had such a great interest in this topic and that they spent a long time researching this information. And due to their large interest, they could retain all this information. And thinking about the repetitive behaviour side at this point, um, are there any behaviours that you perhaps you've noticed in your own child that they have to perform each day and perhaps in a certain way? So, for example, some autistic children I've worked with have had to line up their toys in a certain way and this had to be done on a daily basis and in exactly the same order. So this is all part of autism. And as I said earlier, the triad is the old diagnostic criteria and is no longer used. 
So since this, there has been further research into autism and sensory needs and anxiety has also been included as main factors associated with autism. Hence why this is now represented as a star. So with regards to the sensory side of this, this will be spoken about in more detail during one of our further parent carer workshops. But children with autism can often have either an oversensitive or undersensitive sensory system. And again, this can fluctuate. So oversensory, uh, oversensitive sensory systems mean that your child might want to wear ear defenders because their ears appear too sensitive to the noise that they are exposed to. Or perhaps your child is oversensitive to touch, meaning that they won't want to wear certain clothes because these feel um, tight on their skin or the labels irritate them so much that they have to be cut out. On the other hand, we have undersensitive sensory systems. So this is where you may see your child displaying sensory seeking behaviours. For example, turning up the TV really loud as this is the only way to hear something or perhaps seeking out loud environments. On a more extreme level, you may see a child with autism biting their arms or head banging, as this, is, as this is the only way to feel the sense of touch as their sensory system is undersensitive. So sensory factors are a key part of autism and hence why they are now included in this star image. Finally, we have anxiety. So children with autism can show a high level of anxiety, which can be linked to all the areas of the star which we've discussed. So they may be anxious because they are unable to follow social interactions and communicate effectively. Or perhaps they're trying to communicate with someone and they aren't being understood. So that can be very anxiety provoking situation, especially if they're in an environment that perhaps they're not used to and that isn't predictable for them. Also thinking about the sensory aspect, if they're in an environment that is producing sensory overload for them, this may make them feel anxious. So this image is a great representation of these areas of autism that may impact your child. But as I said, we will go into these in a bit more detail as we continue through our parent carer workshops. So I have touched previously about how social interaction can be tricky for an autistic child. But now let's have a more in-depth look at this. So firstly, we have friendship. So children with autism can find it difficult to understand social rules about how to make friends and maintain these friendships. So if we think back to the point that I made earlier about social communication and building on conversations with people, this can become a barrier for autistic children and helping them to form these friendships. So quite often when, we, um, when people have conversations with each other, we tend to follow the structure of responding to a question then asking another question and then building on from what that person has said and what they've responded with. Autistic children can often find turn taking in a conversation um, difficult and quite often might turn the conversation back to their own topic of interest because this is what they feel confident talking about. Therefore, this can make it difficult for them to form friendships because they're not always following what the other person is saying and developing that shared interest. And at times, by them turning back the conversation to their own topic, this can make the child um, seem disinterested in what the other person is saying. Therefore, these difficulties with social interaction can impact the friendships they're forming. Next, we have empathy and emotions. So autistic children are not always able to read other people's emotions and show empathy in the appropriate way. So for example, if you ask someone if they're okay and they respond, yes, I'm fine, a child with autism will take this as face value and will find it difficult to pick up on more subtle cues such as body language, facial expressions and tone of voice, which may suggest otherwise. So this then makes it difficult for the child to show empathy as they've not picked up the, what, how the other person may actually be feeling because they've missed out on those social cues um, and they may not have realised that they're unhappy just because they've answered fine. So that can affect the emotions and empathy that they show towards the other person. The next point we have is honesty. So children with autism tend to sometimes be too honest and won't even tell little white lies. So autistic children can often be very rule based and very black and white ways of thinking. So things are either right or they're wrong. And this can cause difficulties in relationships and friendships because due to being rule based, they then might tell on their friend for something that they're doing essentially wrong which then might lead to rifts in the relationship. So for example, if they see their friend in class using a black pen, when they've been told to use a blue pen, the child may tell on their friend as this is not following the rules that they've been told to do. And there's a sense of injustice there. 
which then might impact on their friendship and social interaction. But again, the child with autism may not realise that that could upset their friend and how that's affected their relationship. Next, we have reading social cues. So this goes back to the point I made about empathy and emotions. So autistic children can find it difficult to read other people and social cues as these are often very subtle. So the use of body language and facial expressions can be difficult for children with autism to pick up on and that these should not be relied on when communicating with someone who has autism. So for example, um, when you say, if someone asks you, how are you feeling? And you reply saying, oh, I'm fine, but your tone of voice seems quite down, your body language is humped, hunched over, you've got um, your facial expressions are saying otherwise, the person with autism is just going to pick up that you're fine because that's what they've heard without picking up on those um, other body language and other subtle social cues. So just being aware about how we're communicating with a child with autism and are we being clear about what we're saying. Next we have being socially inappropriate. So children with autism are sometimes described as not having a filter. So you may be walking down the road and they will say, mummy, why is that person so fat? Or perhaps they want to hug someone who they barely know. And um, this is relates back to that awareness of those, what, those social, social cues and what is and isn't appropriate in society. So, and again, that also comes back to that need of being honest. If they thought about something, they should be honest and say that. Um, when actually, it seems come, sometimes can come across rude and inconsiderate. We also have seeing things differently. So autistic individuals can often see things in a different way to children perhaps without autism. So one example of this is celebrities and actors who are autistic and have said that being autistic is, is what has made them a success. So for example, um, Anthony Hopkins, um, famous actor, he said that his autism has made him so much more creative when thinking about developing film plots and characters um, and that he wouldn't have been the success that he is if he didn't have his autism. Um, so this can be seen as a real positive. Um, alternatively, autistic children can read interactions between people differently. Um, so, for example, they may see two children play fighting, but they may misread this and think they're fighting for real and that this is serious and dangerous. Autistic individuals can also show high levels of determination. So I mentioned this a little earlier in the quiz that autistic children can show a high level of determination towards a topic of interest. So this means that they'll show um, high levels of dedication to this subject and may spend hours researching into this or if it's a TV program watching this and they will retain all the information that they need. And this determination could be really useful because if they're going into a career around this topic, then they're going to be really determined in their line of work. And finally, we have time alone. So although children with autism like to have time alone, they may also be lonely because they find it difficult to interact with other people to end up being on their own. It's important that autistic children have a place to go to have that time alone, especially if we're thinking about the school environment, which is probably quite loud, it's busy. So having that space safe space to go to remove themselves of this from this is really beneficial. However, it's useful to bear in mind that due to social interaction difficulties, autistic children may be spending time on their own because they are lonely. Therefore, it may be useful to think about how you can support the child with social interactions. So if we're thinking at school, there could be structured activities and games with other people at both break and lunchtime to help them promote these social interactions without other people. So this is just an overview to show how social interactions can be tricky for autistic children and something that we should hold in mind about how this might impact them. Next, we're going to talk about social communication. So as humans, when we communicate with people, we use all these different forms of communication. So thinking about body language, tone of voice, facial expressions. When we are talking to someone with autism, they may find social communication a bit more challenging as they cannot read or process all these different ways of communicating. So if we take the first two points, facial expressions and tone of voice, so I have touched on this before in the previous slides. Um, so just thinking about the example again, that if we are, if someone asks us, are you OK? And we answer yes, with our head bowed down and a sigh, they may make the assumption that you are fine, even though your tone of voice and body language would suggest otherwise. 
So just being aware of um, of using our body language and relying on this. When, when communicating with someone with autism, we want to be direct um, and give them the best opportunity to process what we're trying to say. Children with autism can also have a literal understanding of verbal communication. In our spoken language, we often use idioms and unusual phrases in our conversations. So we might say things like, it's raining cats and dogs out there, or come on, pull up your socks, we've got to get going. But for a child with autism, that can be very confusing. So if you said to them, come on, quick, quick, we've got to go, pull up your socks, they may actually bend down and pull up their socks. An example of this is I was working with a child once and we went to the school office and I said, oh, can I speak to the head teacher, please? Um, want to show all the great work that this child has done. And the office lady turned around and said, oh, she's a bit tied up at the moment. And this child's face just dropped because he was thinking that the, the head teacher was physically tied up with ropes and things. Um, and I had to explain that, oh, it's just a you know, a phrase that we use in language, and it means that she's a bit busy at the moment, so she'll see us later. So just being really aware of all these idioms and phrases that we use in our language and how these can, how literally these can be interpreted by children with autism. Often as well, when we're talking, we don't always say exactly what we mean. So, so quite often we skate around an issue, hoping that someone will take the hint um, that perhaps we don't want to do something or we don't want to go somewhere. Um, and thinking about sometimes when we say things or ask a question, we say things in a way that implies that there's a choice when actually there isn't one. So thinking about when we say to a child, come on, should we go to the hall for assembly now? Using that question and that rhetorical question that could be taken literally as the child has a choice, in which case they're probably going to reply and say no. So again, just being aware about what kind of verbal communication we are using um, and how perhaps a child with autism may interpret this. Finally, we may prefer alternative methods of communication. So think about how can we support an autistic child with communicating. So an example of this is using visuals as well as verbal communication. So as we're saying something, we might show a picture so the child knows exactly what we're trying to say. And again, that relates back to helping with that slower processing system. So if a child with autism is having difficulty processing that verbal communication, using a picture may be beneficial because they can process all that information at once in one picture without having to listen to the beginning of the, of the sentence and then the end of the sentence and then having to hold all of that in mind. So again, just think about how can we support your child's communication and using alternative methods of this may be beneficial. So next we're going to look at restrictive and repetitive behaviours of interest. Again, I have touched on this a little bit, but we'll now look at this in more depth. Firstly, we have attention to detail and perfectionism. So autistic children can have an eye for detail and often find it easier to focus on the details of an object rather than looking at the whole picture. This can then mean that when it comes to your child's completing a task, such as homework, they may be more focused on all the details and that each detail must be perfect. Often when I speak about this in parent groups, parents say that if their child makes a mistake during their homework, they will have to start the whole piece again rather than just crossing through this and continuing. And this comes back to that point about having an, an attention to detail and wanting things to be perfect. Next, we have an insistence on sameness. So this comes back to the point I made earlier about children having set routines and following these daily, as this provides predictability and reduces the level of anxiety. So this can also apply to food choices and clothing that is worn. So autistic children insist on sameness, so they will prefer to wear the same style of clothing and eat the same brands of food, again because this helps them to lower the anxiety and feel content. They know what makes them happy and if they can continue to have that regularity and predictability in their life that will help lower their um, feelings of anxiety. Due to this insistence on sameness, this can then make change a difficult experience. In the world that we live in, it can be very unpredictable and changes do occur. And change can cause a lot of uncertainty for a child with autism and can raise their anxiety levels. So therefore, we want to be thinking about how can we support your child with autism when a change does have to occur and how can we com communicate this effectively to them in a way that they understand and can process this. Going back to the point I made about determination in the previous slide, Autistic children can be seen as experts in areas of speciality. 
Due to this dedication and determination of a topic, they can then spend hours researching and memorising facts about a topic and becoming experts in this field, which can be seen as a real strength. Finally, autistic children can find it difficult to shift their attention and generalise between different environments. For example, something that they may have learned at home, they may find it difficult to apply this at school due to the different environments. So just keep it in mind that if you teach your child something at home, they may not be able to apply this in different environments. So overall, we've spoken about how social communication, social interaction and restrictive and repetitive behaviours are all part of an autism diagnosis and how this can impact our child with autism. So it's important just to hold this in mind when we're thinking about autism as a whole. So this image here is just an example of how a child with autism may focus on details without considering the whole picture and making sense of the whole situation. So in this picture of the pond, they may be more focused on the duck rather than the whole scene that's going on. Finally, I thought I would add in some potential differences that are seen with girls. So as I mentioned earlier during the quiz, it feels as though less girls have autism, but actually girls tend to be on average diagnosed at a later age than boys. And this is because girls are very good at masking their difficulties at school and other social areas. And this is, this is because they want to be seen to fit in and follow the rules and they don't want to get into trouble. And it might, might not be that until they get home and they're in their safe space that they feel comfortable enough to express these difficulties that they've been experiencing and holding in all day. So that's why girls tend to be diagnosed at a later stage than boys. Another reason for girls being diagnosed at a later stage is because they present differently from the classic male presentation. For example, their interests may appear more similar to the neurotypical, so for example, being interested in makeup. And again, this relates back to the need to follow social norms and copy their peers' interests. However, it is important to know that there are boys that can present in this girls' profile way, masking and trying to copy their peers with interest but it is more commonly seen in girls. So I just thought it was useful to talk a bit about girls and on the slide there, there are some more points about potential differences that we see between girls and boys and that this is useful just to hold in mind. And I just wanted to include this slide here because it sometimes can be very difficult to remember the strengths um, of autism. So it's really important that we focus on the positives of autism. And as I said before, Many actors and actresses with autism use their autism as a strength to be creative and unique when developing characters and storylines. Also, the determination and dedication towards a topic of interest that we have discussed can be seen as a real strength as autistic individuals can remain focused on their topic of interest for long periods of time. Therefore, this could be really beneficial. So it's important to focus on these strengths when thinking about autism. I also wanted to draw your attention to this slide, which highlights all the companies that are employing people with autism. So something that comes up quite often in our parent groups is many parents worrying about their children growing up with autism and how this will impact them in the future. But many companies are now focusing on the positives of autism that we mentioned before and are using their strengths to support their companies. So I think back to a real life example that I had. Um, I was working in a company before and we had this um, big spreadsheet and one of the formulas had gone wrong somewhere. And for weeks, people in our company were looking at this spreadsheet and just couldn't work it out. Anyway, we called in a specialist and um, this specialist that came in was someone that openly um, told us that he was diagnosed with autism. Um, and he said that he got into this company because his special interest was in spreadsheets and numbers. And within about half hour of sitting up this spreadsheet, he'd found the formula that had a slight error in it and was impacting the whole of the spreadsheet. And it's just showing that for people who didn't have autism, sitting up that spreadsheet for weeks trying to find the mistake was really challenging. But for someone who has autism and those strengths of looking at patterns and numbers, that was a real benefit to that company um, and just showing how you can use those strengths. So finally, this is a nice quote to end on from Temple Grandin, which highlights how we should not be trying to change someone with autism in order to fit into the world that we live in. And instead, we should be meeting them halfway and building bridges to support people with and without autism communicating effectively. So I just want to leave that up there for a minute for you to read and take in.
So as we come to the end of today's presentation, I'd just like to highlight some um, resources and websites where you can get further information. So all of these um, websites that I've put up on the slide have great information about autism and different ways of supporting your children. So if you would like to look at any of these, then go ahead straight to the website and they can give you all the resources that you need. So thank you for joining me today. I hope that the content provided has been useful. But again, if you do have any questions about the content, then please do contact the autism service on the autism service at cognis.org.uk and someone will get back to you. Thank you. Your feedback on this session is greatly appreciated in order for us to improve our service for other parents and carers. If you do have a spare two minutes to follow the link on the slide and fill out the feedback form, that would be great. The link is also in the description of the video if you're unable to access it via the slide. Once again, I want to thank you for joining me today and I hope this has been a helpful experience for you.